Check, check, check. You guys ready to do this? Who loves Justin Chapel? We all love Justin Chapel. Hi, everybody. My name is Devin Padgett. I'm producer of special projects for Food & Wine. This is my favorite time of year. Raise your hand if this is your first year with us at the Classic. Wow. Check that out. Lots of rookies. How's it going? Anybody get wet out there at that last grand tasting? All right, cool. Well, that's Aspen style, so uh, we still drink and we still eat no matter what the weather does, but thanks for being here. Hopefully this first classic is doing you proud, and I couldn't be more happy to bring out one of our homegrown success, success stories here at the classic and here at the magazine at the brand Food & Wine, Justin Chapel. This is his ninth classic, and the story is, it's a true story, Justin started with us nine years ago as an intern on the classic team. And now he's the culinary director for the brand, which is super cool. Amazing, meteoric rise. He's a great cook, a great chef, a great cookbook author. Just Cook It, you guys have this one? Okay, if you don't, you need to get it. Um, and here's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to bring Justin out in just a second. And you guys have to be small but mighty, loud, loud, loud. We're going to give a raucous Aspen welcome to Justin when I say his name. You guys have to act like... The Rolling Stones are coming out here because Justin's actually, he's hotter than the Rolling Stones. So we want to make them, we want to make Curtis sweat over here. So can you guys do that? And we're going to extend it. So we're going to keep it going for five or six seconds, like really, really, really loud. You guys ready? A warm Aspen welcome for the one and only Justin Chappell. Um, wow, Devin, thank you so much. I was actually supposed to introduce myself, and then uh, I was like, unless Devin's here, then I want Devin to introduce me. And then he, he plays it real cool. He's like, eh, if you want me to. I don't know. I could think of something to say. Um, it's true. I started as an intern on the classic team. So I used to um, sit at a thing that the team here knows as in exhibitor check-in, where all the exhibitors come, and they check in, and they get their little passes, and they get their stickers so they could bring their wine back home. And... I sat there for hours checking people in. Um, and uh, after doing that for almost a year, I joined the editorial team in the test kitchen where I started as a recipe tester. And now here I am at the Food and Wine Classic in Aspen. It's my ninth year. And I'm very excited because, thank you. And it's our 36th classic, which is crazy. Ha um, OK, so Devin asked who, who was, this is our first time. How many of you have been here like more than five times? Wow, that's great. What about more than, well, I said more than five, so I guess I shouldn't say more than 10. How many, who, has anyone been here 10, 10 times, 10 years? Wow, thank you very much. We wouldn't be able to be here without you, um, or KitchenAid, as you could see, because I wouldn't have anywhere to cook. Um, so I'm very excited to be here again. Uh, this is my third time demonstrating, uh, doing a cooking demo, and I, I love it. It's really fun. Um, this year, I'm especially excited because I get to show everybody my brand new cookbook. Out, uh, it came out May 1st. It's available now. Um, we have it in the merchandise tent uh, in the Grand Tasting. So I'm doing a signing today at 4.30, if you're interested. Um, I take Venmo. I take American Express. I take um, cash. <laughs> Actually, you could use all your forms of payment in the uh, Grand Tasting tent. Um, so hopefully, you'll buy my book. Hopefully, you'll come say hi. And um, hopefully, you'll try some of these recipes at home. Um, I'm doing, I think I bit off more than I chew today, um, so I'm going to get started. But So I'm doing some recipes for my book. And just to tell you a little bit about what my book is, um, basically, so I've been at Food & Wine for nine years. I've been in the test kitchen the entire time. Um, and over the years, I've basically tested recipes from all the top chefs, you know, not top chefs from the show, but like the big name chefs all around the country uh, and some across the world. Um, I've tested their recipes, and I've learned so much from them. Um, but I've also developed a lot of tricks along the way. Um, in fact, I have a video series I started about seven years ago um, called Mad Genius Tips. Ha, do, does anybody know what Mad Genius Tips is? <laughs> That's OK, great. Wow. OK, I think we need to, everyone has a little homework to do. <laughs> 
Um, so Mad Genius Tips, we started about seven years ago. It's a video series all about making, um, prepping ingredients in a really fun kind of oddball way. So you can, people nowadays call them food hacks. Way back when, when I started it, we didn't call them food hacks, but as um, the industry evolved, that's what we now call them. Um, so it's a lot of cooking hacks. Um, and so I've developed a lot of those. I've learned a lot of those from people, uh, some of them from chefs that are demonstrating here, like Richard Blaze, who I know is um, upstairs now. Um, and Curtis Stone, who's next door, and I think that we won because I haven't heard them yell, so that's good. <laughs> um, and ba so basically with Just Cook It in my new book, what I've done is I've taken all these tricks I've learned throughout the years um, along with um, techniques that I learned in culinary school and working in restaurants, and I basically put them into a book so that um, you can use them at home. Um, but the, the best part about it, in my opinion, is that um, my, the, whole, the whole point and the key takeaway that I want um, everyone who reads it to, to walk away with is that cooking doesn't have to be intimidating. It doesn't have to be stressful. It doesn't have to be scary. And it should always be fun. Um, Andrew Zimmern is a friend of mine, and he actually um, gave me a really fun slogan for the book that I've been using ever since it came out. And he said, I love the book because you're telling people that it's not, it shouldn't be scary, it shouldn't be intimidating, and it's only food, so you should just cook it. And I was like, yes. I wish I thought of that when I came up with the title. Um, but, <laughs> but then I pretend like I did. Um, so uh, that's the whole idea. And so um, I'm going to do some recipes um, for you today. The first one I'm doing is nudie, uh, ricotta nudie. Does anybody know what nudie is? Nudie? You know what gnocchi is? Yes. OK. So nudie is basically gnocchi except with, with cheese instead of potato. So you're using ricotta, fresh ricotta, which it looks like this. Um, the culinary team here actually made this for me fresh. Thank you guys. I know. Um, they're very, they're very awesome here. All of them. Um, they work very hard. Um, we'll give them a round of applause at the end. Okay. <laughs> um, so it's instead of using uh, cooked potato, you're starting with ricotta. Um, now the thing is, wow. <laughs> I mean, uh, what is that even? Um, either they have a lot of crazy people or really fun music. Um, so instead of potato, I'm using ricotta. Now the thing about nudie is it's really intimidating because if you, if you overwork the dough or you incorporate too much flour, it'll be really dense and there'll be like rocks instead of like pillowy kind of uh, dumplings that you want. Um, so I kind of use this trick. Um, I have two tricks for making it foolproof at home. Um, I'm gonna show you both of them today, uh, but let's get started. So I'm gonna, in this food processor, I'm gonna add some ricotta. So this is fresh ricotta. Can you guys see this? OK. It's nice and cold, which is why it's crumbly. Wow, you guys really packed it in this bowl. Thank you. <laughs> Put it right in here. Um, and if you guys have questions while I'm cooking, feel free to just yell them out, because I don't like silence. I, if, if, if you guys have come to any of my demos before, in the, last year I had Tamron Hall here from the Today Show. Um, does everybody know who Tamron is? Yeah. I love her. She was too busy to come this year, but um, she is missed. I've already had someone come up and say, why isn't Tamron here? There you are. <laughs> I was like, I'm not good enough for you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm not kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm really just kidding. Um, okay, so I have two eggs, I have ricotta, I'm adding a couple tablespoons of olive oil, um, I'm adding some uh, Parmesan cheese right in here, and a good pinch of salt. You could add pepper to this as well if you'd like. That's not that much salt. <laughs> Who said that was too much salt? This, is, this feeds like six people. And I'm just going to puree this. And, the re and I'm going to incorporate flour, but the reason I didn't put the flour in yet is because the more you work flour, the more gluten will be developed, and then that's when you get really dense um, dumplings. And that's really the trick behind this recipe is because you're not working it with your hands, you don't need, you're not going to incorporate too much flour, you're not going to overwork the dough, because you're just using a handy-dandy food processor here. So I'm going to add this. One of the things that I always joke about is, um, so... I, this is my second cookbook. My first book is Mad Genius Tips, named after the video series I did, both of which are available in the tents. Um, and what I try to explain to people is that when you write a cookbook, like you never remember the recipes. I mean, there's 145 recipes in here, and people are all the time are like, well, how much is that, and how much is in there? 
I don't know. <laughs> they measured out the ingredients for me. And I'm just going to puree this. You could see, can, can, can you guys see that? Yeah. You see how the dough is coming together? So it's nice and thick, and that's it. That's the, the nudie dough. Now, normally what you would do is you would scrape this out onto a floured work surface, and you'd, you'd be rolling it, and then you'd be shaping it. And it's, it's at that point that people either incorporate too much flour because it's sticky, or they um, overwork it, and then it gets too glutinous. So the trick here is an ice cream scoop. That wasn't very, I don't think people got as excited as I did. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow, there you go, wow, an ice cream scoop. <laughs> um, so basically, rather than you know, putting the dough out, rolling it, um, cutting it, which is what you normally do, I literally just take an ice cream scoop and I scoop it right into the water. And one of the, thing that, one of the things that I try to teach people in the book, and I try to explain to people, and I, I really do this at Food and Wine, it's like really my job to like make cooking less difficult and a little bit more approachable, is I tell people, you go to restaurants to get perfect food, right? That's where you expect your steak to be cooked right. That's where you expect your plate to be beautiful. Can I take one of these? Look at these beautiful KitchenAid towels. Thank you, KitchenAid. Um, but when you're at home, the only thing that matters is if your food is delicious. Right? And that you have fun making it. And so that's what one of the things I tell people when making the nudie is these are not going to look perfect when you take them out. They're definitely not. They're going to be a little shaggy. Um, they're going to be irregular because, as you can see, I'm cutting them in different sizes. Let me just turn that up a little bit. Um, but they're all going to taste really, really good because it's the same batter. Um, and they're actually going to be even better because you're incorporating less flour using the food processor and the ice cream scoop. So it's like, that's all you need. I'm not even going to make all these. I'm going to make enough for me. <laughs> I'm not allowed to feed anyone. I know, isn't that sad? Start a riot. Um, OK, so I'm going to let this go. And these are going to cook for about five minutes. Um, but I want to show you um, another way that, and this is actually what I call Imaginious Tips a mad genius tip. Um, I've done a video of this, and it's really crazy. But the, the interesting thing about this is it is a food hack, but it's a food hack I actually learned working in restaurants. So chefs actually use this technique. Um, so all you need is a resealable plastic bag. This is a gallon size. Um, and what you do is you open it up. You take your batter, your, sorry, your gnocchi dough. Is someone going to keep track of time for me? Okay, somebody in the audience needs to be in charge of the time. You tell me if I'm taking too long, or if I need to speed up, or if I need to slow down, or if I'm talking too much, or if I'm not talking enough. But I think I always talk too much. So does Curtis, because I can hear him. Talking, 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 like there's nothing else to do, Curtis. You gotta cook. Um, so I put it in a resealable plastic bag. Obviously, I'm not making the whole thing. I squeeze it into a corner. You can also use a pastry bag if you have them, which, believe it or not, you could get pastry bags just about anywhere nowadays. Um, and then I just snip off the edge here. These are cooking way faster than I thought. Before we started, I was like, OK, I'm going to get these going. Then I'm going to get onto the soup. I was telling Jasmine. Um, OK, so I cut off the corner, twist it. I take a little knife here. And the, actually, the mad genius tip that I do for food and wine, and you can go to foodandwine.com to see the video, or you can go to YouTube, um, Food and Wine's YouTube, is I take a piece of kitchen twine, and I tie it across the two handles here, really, really tight, really taut. And then I, what I do is I squeeze the, the nudie batter, and I use the string to cut it into the water, which is what I learned in restaurants, because we had to make so many and so quickly, and we made them to order, that we just had a humongous rondo with like string tied across it. And you were standing there, and it was like your job, like choo, 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 choo just to make like hundreds of them. Um, but you can also use a little paring knife. So you just squeeze it like this, just like that. And these are littler. These are like appetizer port sizes. And they go right in. And just like the ice cream scoop, you're not incorporating too much flour, you're not overworking the dough, and you're good to go. OK, so that is the nudie. Let's let that cook, because I'm going to get on with the rest of it. I'm going to put that there. OK, while well that cooks, I'm going to actually make the, um, the topping for this, actually. Because these, these have to cook for about five minutes. I don't know. I haven't been keeping track. What's that? It's on like medium low, but of course we're at like 
what, 9,000 square feet? Ni that's square feet. <laughs> We're at 9,000 square feet, everyone. I don't know who's been lying to you. I know. Um, I can never control water up here. I was actually um, doing a video earlier, and we were, do we were making a frittata, and it took like twice as long to cook. And I never thought that it would affect eggs that way, but the elevation actually made the eggs take longer to cook in the oven. It was crazy. Okay, so the nudie is a really light dumpling, um, and it's gonna kind of look like the dumplings that your grandma would put on like chicken and dumplings, you know? You scoop it on top, that's what it's gonna look like. I love it. Um, but because it's like such a light, um, delicate dumpling, I like to serve it with something simple like sauteed spinach. So I'm gonna saute some spinach to put underneath, but I'm also using one of my secret ingredients. Um, this, there's a recipe for, so this is also in my book, it's called dukkha. Does anybody know what dukkha is? Yeah, okay, of course you do, Christopher. <laughs> knows what dukkha is. Is, it in, does, is there a non-chef who knows what dukkha is? There's somebody back there. Okay, Christopher, really loudly, you need to tell everyone what dukkha is. Okay, he's not gonna do it. Okay. <laughs> dukkha is basically like, a, it's a Middle Eastern spice and nut mix, and it's, tr all, oftentimes you find, you eat it with um, like a flatbread with olive oil, and you like sprinkle it on top, and it's really, really fra fragrant, and it's really er um, delicious. Um, and I make a version here using almonds and pistachios, and what I do, and this obviously makes a ton, and so I make a big batch of it, and I keep it in the freezer, and I sprinkle it on like almost anything. So I sprinkle it on the, the Dumplings here, I put it on ricotta toast, I put it on um, an avocado pizza, which I have a recipe for in my book, avocado pizza, which is basically pizza dough with, yes. <laughs> See, I should have made the avocado pizza. <laughs> but it's basically guacamole on a dough, so. Um, okay, so <laughs> okay, I'm gonna put someone in charge of this book. Is this the book I'm allowed to touch? Okay. Okay, somebody, you, because you yelled it. You come here, if I forget an ingredient, you have to tell me how much is in it. But also, you need to find the picture of the avocado pizza because I don't know where it's at. Here. What is your name? Mitch. Don't leave with that. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so I have some roasted almonds. I'm putting in some shelled pistachios. Um, and then here is a mixture of spices that we toasted before everyone came in. There's sesame seeds, caraway seeds, cumin seeds, and coriander seeds. Now, the reason why I like to use whole seeds is for one, when you crush them up, I was supposed to do these first. I, okay, I'm already messing up. Um, so I usually like to put the seeds in before the nuts because then I grind the seeds before I add the nuts, but we're gonna go with it. It's only food, let's just cook it. Um, you see how I worked that in there? Ah, yeah, now it's all coming together. Um, so the reason I use the whole seeds is because one of the things that um, we often tell people at Food & Wine, I tell people all the time is, believe it or not, when you buy ground spices, they only last like six months. So don't buy big jars, buy small jars, keep them for like a couple months and then get rid of them. Um, but whole spices you could keep much longer. All right, who's guilty? Who has spices from three years ago? Yeah. And then when you make your recipe from foodandwine.com and you're like, this doesn't have enough flavor, this is because you're using old spices. There you go. You're learning things here. <laughs> okay, so I have it in the, the chopper. I love this little chopper, by the way. I got to use these because I went to this, um, I can't remember what it's called. What is it called, the PGA? The Senior PGA. Um, it, the, I think, I, did I say it right? Okay, the KitchenAid Senior PGA. <laughs> I did a demonstration there, and I, I think this is new, and I got to use it there, and I kept hinting that I wanted one, and nobody sent me one. <laughs> I could just buy it. I'll just buy one, but I love it because you can hold the handle and you just go like that, and it has a little drizzle spout here. Okay, and I forgot salt. I knew I was gonna forget salt. Okay, so you grind it up just like this, and I put a little cayenne in there because I like it to be a little spicy. And let me show you what this looks like. My dumplings are probably done. Holy moly, I forgot about them. All right, how do I take this off? There we go. Um, all right, I'm gonna put it in here because I want you to see this. Here, can you get this? So this is what we call dukkha. And it's basically a really, really fragrant, um, delicious spice mix that you can, like I said, put on anything. I'm actually gonna put a little in a bowl because I want you guys to smell it because one of the reasons you use whole spices is because they have so much more flavor and so much more aroma than the ground ones. And you'll see what I mean when you smell this. Can I pass this around? Somebody come grab it. Somebody come grab it. I'll do two of them, one for each side. The north, south, the east, and the west. 
because I don't know what direction is what. So I'm going to pass this around, and you guys could smell it, and you'll smell all the spices. There we go. Nobody eat it. <laughs> I'm not allowed to let you eat anything. All right, let's take the dumpling out because I overcooked it. No, I just take it right out of the freezer and I, I sprinkle it. And I like, the reason I like that is because, um, or the reason I make a big batch is because, like I said, it's really versatile. Um, but also, I'm like the type of person, I actually do entertain a lot, but when I entertain, I don't like, I actually do take a lot of shortcuts, I'm not gonna lie. And sometimes what I do is I just put crudite out with like hummus, but, and I do, store, I have really delicious um, hummus recipes in my book, but sometimes I buy store-bought hummus and I just, make it look pretty in a bowl. So I um, put the hummus in a bowl, a pretty little bowl, and then I drizzle olive oil on top and then I put the duke on top. And everyone's like, oh my God, this is delicious. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, I know I, I forgot to make it, so I rushed right before you got here. <laughs> and I'm burning my nonstick skillet over here. Can I change my mind? <laughs> All right, <laughs> okay. Am I allowed to move this? Ah! I'm just kidding. <laughs> Is that, oh, can we? I'm really sorry. This is Jasmine, ladies and gentlemen. Don't clap, she's carrying water. Don't clap. She's carrying water. You guys are crazy. Okay, I have a really hot pan here because I forgot about it. Okay, so I'm gonna finish the Duke. I'm gonna go faster because I think I'm running out of time. Gosh, and they give me this thing that pours it so slow. A little olive oil in there. Um, now, I put these out onto a, a baking sheet with just a little olive oil because you can eat these just like this. Just drizzle them with olive oil, hit them with the duca, you're good to go. Um, sometimes what I like to do in the summer, if I want to keep it really, really light, and if I'm really, really lazy, I make them, and I just put like parsley on top and chives and olive oil and crunchy sea salt. That's it. Um, it's really, really good. But I'm going to take it up a notch, and I'm going to cook a little spinach to go with it. So I have some baby spinach here. I'm going to slice a garlic clove. Oops, that's not a chef's knife. I think there's garlic in it. Can you look up the recipe? OK. Thank you for measuring my garlic appropriately, correctly. OK, I'm going to add it in here. Oh, thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. You gotta keep me on my toes. Oops. And uh, so the reason why I'm letting them kind of hang out here is because when you take them out of the water, they're really, really delicate. They're really light. So I like to let them hang out for a few minutes and then they firm up just a little bit because what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually um, cook them in this pan. At home, you just use one pan, okay? Because you don't want your kids to get angry since everyone makes their kids do dishes, right? Okay, with a show of hands, who in the house is responsible for doing the dishes? Oh, it's all, is it, I can't tell, is it all the guys or all the girls? It's all the guys. Well, I do the cooking and the cleaning in my house. All right, so I'm heating up this pan here. I don't, okay, there we go. And um, I think these have rusted a little bit, so I'm going to just get the oil a little hot, and then I'm going to add them in here. And what I'm, what I'm going to do is just get them a little brown on a couple sides. There we go. One time I started a fire up here, so I'm really scared right now. <laughs> it was like, and everybody was like, whoa! And I was like, I did not mean to do that. I get really afraid of that sort of thing. Look at it. It's like I'm afraid. Let's go to simmer. I'm not one of these guys who wants to like show off with fire all the time. Some people are. I think I turned that down too low too. Look at me. Oh my god. What's happening here? I don't know how to cook anymore. So <laughs> Those are just gonna go, and this is actually baby spinach, so the recipe in the book calls for leaf spinach or baby spinach. 
I actually prefer to use leaf spinach. So leaf spinach is the kind that you buy in the bunches. Or sometimes you buy them in the 10 ounce pack and it just looks like what we call adult spinach, you know, fully grown. Um, I actually prefer to use that because it doesn't have as much water in it. So when you're sauteing it and it wilts down, then you don't have all that green juice at the bottom of your plate. But for baby spinach, I'm gonna stop there because it's gonna continue to cook. I'm gonna plate this right over here. You, I mean, the stem is edible, it's a little bitter, um, and it has a lot of water in it, so I recommend taking the stems out. I mean, you can eat it, though. You can really, I mean, it's the same thing, like, I know spinach is not cheese, but it's kind of the same thing where everyone cuts off the rind off their cheese when you, most, most cheeses, even if it doesn't look like it, you can usually eat the rind. I obviously have a lot more spinach here. I did not cook it all, and that's because I decided I was only gonna make one portion. What am I doing? All right, all right. those still need to cook. Those still need to cook. It's because I was afraid of the fire. I, I'm gonna put these in here too, actually. I actually like these little ones because they're, they firm up even more and they're really easy to handle. And now I'm gonna have this weird mishmash plate where everything's gonna look awkward because I'm gonna have big and little gnocchi, nudie. Um, okay, so I'm gonna let that go. Jasmine, if I forget about it, just holler at me because I have a tendency to talk too much and forget about what I'm doing. Okay, so we have our nudie going. I'm gonna actually show you how to make an, a starter here. This is the easiest starter you'll ever make. It's a gazpacho. Um, I call it golden gazpacho or yellow gazpacho. What do I call it? Look it up, hurry up, hurry up. We don't have all day. <laughs> um, I like to use um, these, these are called Zuma tomatoes. Um, I like them because um, they come in the little package that is also a colander, so you could just rinse them in there and then drain them out, and then I'm like, oh, there you go, I didn't need a colander. Um, but because I have other people prepping for me, I'm like, can you wash it in the biggest colander you guys have? <laughs> and only wash one tomato at a time. That's what I say. I'm just kidding. I'm not like that, am I? Okay, good. <laughs> okay. I'm trying to figure out where to put these because I want you to see this because I'm going to show you a mad genius tip right now. Okay, so I'm actually using this very high-powered KitchenAid blender, so you don't need to even cut these. So I'm not going to cut them all um, because this thing is powerful enough to puree even the, the, all the skins. Um, but I'm going to show you a mad genius tip using these. Has anyone seen this trick before? Yes? No? Okay. So whenever you need to cut a lot of cherry tomatoes at one time, you can use two little takeout lids like this or you can use two small plates that have um, a rim on the bottom. And what you do is you just take your little tomatoes, put it right in here. This is great for your salads, for your crudités. Whatever, whatever you want. Um, and then you go like this, and then you eat them just like this. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You don't. But what you do is you take a knife. I'm actually going to use a serrated knife. Oh, that one's kind of not big enough. I should have familiarized myself with the knife block before I got here. Oh, is there no serrated knife in here? There's two slicers. That's okay, I'll use this one. So what you do is you hold it up, keep your fingers up, and you cut through just like that. And then you have all these tomatoes. <laughs> Literally every time I do that, I'm like, you didn't know I, that you could do that? <laughs> okay, you see how beautiful these are? I got a little too much color, that's good. And then I'm going to, where should I plate it? Because I don't know what you guys could see and you can't see. Plate over here. Oh, in your mouth. I'm gonna have to talk to you after class. Don't be dirty. If Tamron was here, she would be so dirty, right? She has a, she's, Tamron's watching. I know people are streaming this on Facebook. Hey, girl. <laughs> All right. So this is it. And then you actually, I was supposed to put a little lemon juice on it. I didn't. But it's only food, so just cook it. And I was also supposed to put butter in there, and I didn't. That's why we have the butter here. She was standing over there like, he's not using the butter. And it's just a little bit of lemon juice. And then you hit it with the duca that I handed around the room that never came back. And there you go. And just like that, you have your really delicious, really, really delicate nudie and your 
nice, light, sauteed spinach. This is Weight Watchers friendly. It's Whole30. It's not either of those things. <laughs> but it doesn't matter because it's delicious. Thank you. It tastes delicious. Um, all right, I don't know. I can't remember how many tomatoes to use. <laughs> use these ones. Oh, use the orange. Okay, so I'm going to use the orange. Three containers. What size container? Okay, so I'm using 30 ounces of tomato. <laughs> I'm going to add them in, like I said, with this. So the, re the reason I like to use the, um, these golden ones, I don't know what these ones are called. They're gold. They're called gold. Grape. grape? They are grape tomatoes. You're correct. You get a gold star today. <laughs> um, I put them right in. I put one crushed garlic clove in there. You could cut it if you want. You don't have to. Put it in. And this is so easy. I literally make this all the time in the summer. Um, but because these cherry tomatoes are available all year, so you can really make this any time of year. Obviously, it's better, for, it's better in the summer. Is there supposed to be water? There. Yes, there is. Read the instructions. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, I am. Um, I actually told my, wait, hold on. Where's my phone at? Oh. Siri, what's my name? Oh, she doesn't get it. My phone broke. Oh, there's no signal. She doesn't know anything. Um, OK, so the other ingredient here is turmeric. And turmeric is actually really good for you, right? Yes. Um, it's actually better if you use it fresh. So if you can get it fresh, do that. Just make sure you wear gloves. Use a plastic cutting board that you can put into the dishwasher because it gets all over everything. We have one, it will make everything yellow. We have one corner of the Food Mine Test Kitchen that, where we do all of our turmeric work because it's, mar it's a white marble and it's like totally all yellow. So I put this in here. I'm actually not doing this because it's super healthy. I'm doing it because um, I like to give the, oh great. I just stained the KitchenAid towel. I am never getting invited back. All right. OK. All right, I'm at speed four. And I need some olive oil. And then I'm going to drizzle in a little bit of extra virgin olive oil. I think that was too much. Uh, <laughs> um, can you see how it's becoming really orange? I'm trying to, I don't know why I'm trying to talk. That's the most important thing. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Christopher. I think that was Christopher, right? OK. Right. That's not a lot of salt. I promise. Um, believe it or not, so I actually like to use kosher salt. Um, and the re I actually talk, so at the beginning of my book, there's a section called um, the pantry, the Just Cook It pantry, where I talk about like the, the, all the ingredients that you should have in the kitchen in order to cook through the book successfully. And um, one of the things I talk about is the different kinds of salt. And the reason I like to use kosher salt is because when you pick it up in your hands, you can actually feel how much you're holding. Um, whereas if it's a really fine salt, um, like table salt or sea salt, oftentimes it's really hard to grab it. And so you don't really know how much you're putting, and then you have to end up putting more or less. And then, um, so I, that's actually why I like to use kosher salt. Also because it, um, it's a little more, it's a little more mellow. It's mellower. I don't know what's proper in English. Mellower. Oh, there you go. <laughs> um, okay, so that's it. And what I would actually do if I was at home, because I have this blender, but mine's black, the same color that I want my chopper. Look at it, she's writing an email right now. Um, I already had someone else write an email, don't worry. <laughs> um, so what I would normally do is I would actually put the lid on this and then I would put this in the refrigerator for an hour before I serve it. You could totally serve it right now like I'm going to do. Well, actually, I have to make the gremolata, so let's put it in here for a minute. Wait, will it fit down here? No. Let's put it in here. It's not going to do anything in like five seconds, but we're going to pretend. 
I have 10 minutes left? Holy crap. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's make gremolata. Oh my god. I'm trying to clean my station. I can't do this anymore. I'm too old for this. Okay, I feel better. All right, we're going to do this fast. Oh, she already set it up. Okay. I'm stressed. Okay. So, does, do, does anybody know what a gremolata is? You've probably had it if you had otsubuko, right? So it's like, it's basically a condiment, essentially, an Italian condiment. And it's, um, you, it's traditionally made with parsley and garlic. I like to make it with um, smoked almonds. This is one of the secret ingredients I talk about in my book because you can buy smoked almonds on just the regular snack aisle, um, and they have so much flavor. Uh, sometimes they do have liquid s smoke, I'm not gonna lie, but when you use it as an ingredient in something, it just adds that little extra something, and everyone's like, oh my god, what is in this? And you're like, I smoke my almonds on my green egg, or whatever. <laughs> but I just buy smoked almonds. Um, so I'm going to put them into the, the chopper. I'm going to add some parsley. And then I'm going to add a garlic clove. I might actually just chop this up, even though it's going right into a chopper. And then I'm going to add the zest of the lemon that I got rid of. There we go. Thank you. It's my fault. Right in there. More or less, depending on how you like it. And then I have it on the chop setting. There's chop and puree, chop and puree. And that's it, like five pushes. And then you get this really delicious um, topping for your soup. I'm just gonna sprinkle it out here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a little here so you guys could pass that around too, so you could smell it. I forgot salt. Didn't I tell you? I told Christy over here. I told her before, I was like, I keep forgetting salt. I don't know what's wrong with me. All right, can we pass this around? Make sure it gets to both sides of the rooms. Room. Maybe you should send it over to Curtis. Okay. All right, that's going to chill. I'm going to make dessert. No. <laughs> Let's get it out of the way. Okay, we're going to serve gazpacho. So this is the golden gazpacho. Well, check out this color. I mean, this is like, you're gonna, if you make this for a party, first of all, there's like three ingredients in the gazpacho, literally. There's garlic, tomato, olive oil, and salt, but I don't count salt as an ingredient, clearly, because I keep forgetting it. <laughs> and put that back there. I literally serve this all summer. I'm not kidding. Like, I serve this all the time. I put the little gremolata on top. Sometimes what I do is I get really fancy. I know I don't have any time. Oh, gosh, here we go. Sometimes I get really fancy because the, the soup actually has a really, really incredible texture. It's, it's like really velvety and smooth. And when you use a high power blender like that, you get a little bit of air incorporated. So what I do is I slice them really thin like this, and I float them on top so that you look fancy. Like you're a chef, but you're not. <laughs> and that's the golden gazpacho. OK. I can totally make this in six and a half minutes. OK. So we're making no-bake cheesecake. Where should I put these so you could see them all together? Here. Camera guy wants it here. Thank you. What is your name again? I'm so sorry. Andy. Andy. Thanks. I'm really bad with names. Um, okay, so I can get rid of this one, actually. Um, okay, so we're making no-bake cheesecake. This is one of my favorite desserts in the whole book. I'm actually not a baker. I don't love to bake that much because I don't have the patience for it, as you can see. Um, I don't have the patience to measure too much. I don't have the patience for all of that when I'm at home. Um, and so, um, and plus I just love savory. I'm a more of a salty person than a sweet. Um, but what I do love to make is no-bake cheesecake. And it starts with a no-bake crust that is made out of Oreos, ladies and gentlemen. This is a two-ingredient crust. I put the Oreos right into a food processor. And the, the secret thing about this is I can actually use, um, let me just let that warm up a little bit. Um, 
it's like a graham cracker crust. You pul pulverize the graham crackers, you add melted bu butter, and then you bake it, right? So in this case, what ends up happening is because you have the cream in the middle, um, it actually works as a binder. And I've actually watched a lot of videos where people scrape this out and then they use the chocolate wafer as the thing. And I'm like, why are people doing that? That's such a waste. The cream is like delicious, <laughs> right? So I was like, I'm gonna try this with the whole Oreos. So I put the whole Oreos in here and I just pulse it. Oh, there's two speeds. Oh, I could walk away. Okay. Right. I'm just trying to melt my butter a little bit on my little hot burner here. Okay. There's a microwave? Well, there is a microwave drawer. Um, I think this is okay. All right, so I'm going to add this in. Oops, I need to. I need to do this side a little bit. Maybe the fork. I said I was going to do this in four minutes. Clearly, apparently not. Okay. Then you add your butter, just like you would your graham cracker crust. It got hard again. Put it down. And the butter really is just gonna give it that extra moisture it needs to stick together. And you can already see how it started like, almost like forming a dough. Um, and what I like to do to know that it's ready is I take a little bit out and I go like this. I squeeze it and if you see it starts to form clumps like that, then you know it's ready. So then you just put it into the bottom of your pan. <laughs> I love that, that comes off, it's really convenient. What's that? I like, I like that too. How do I do this? Oh, just, oh my God. <laughs> it's like you just lift everything. You lift the lid off, you lift the thing off. All right, put it right in here. And I'm not gonna get to all this, so what I'm gonna basically do is I'm gonna say you press it in like really hard, put it in there, get it going. Sometimes what I like to do is I like to take a little bowl or something like this, um, or a ramekin, um, and then I press it and that helps you pack it nice and firm. I mean, everybody's done this, right? Yes. And I, I, I actually like to press it up the side about three quarters of an inch, and that gives you kind of a ring around the bottom to protect it. Then this goes in the fridge, and then the fridge chills it in three seconds. <laughs> and then you get that. Um, I'm just gonna wipe this out really quick because I need to use it again. Um, okay, so now the filling. Do you guys care if the filling is a little Oreo-ish? Okay. Just, thank you. You see, Andrew Zimmer and I owe him a, a lot. Do we have a reverse spatula? Okay. I'll use this one. I think I took it already. I used it for something else. Okay, so this is the filling. I have some... I'm doing two cheeses in here. Obviously, you have to do cream cheese because, in my opinion, like cheesecake needs cheap cream cheese. This is really cold cream cheese here. Should have put it in the bottom. Sometimes what I like to do is, um, oh, thank you, is I like when I'm when I'm I actually when I use food processors or any really piece of kitchen equipment, I try to think of them as like, well, how what's the best way to build this? So normally I would put like the chunkier things in the bottom and then the runnier things on top, or sometimes I put the water in the bottom. But in this case, I'm just gonna put it all in. And I'm running out of time. How much time do I have? All right. This is cream cheese, it's really thick. And I'm, the Curtis Stone would kill me, because I'm like shoving it in with my hands. I actually like, um, when I make this, I, can you tell me, does it say at room temperature? Yeah. Okay, room temperature, I forgot ingredients. I got agave. <laughs> See, you were right. Sugar, no. 
Ricotta. Oh, I'm sorry, ricotta and cream cheese. So it's ricotta and cream cheese. And the reason I do that is because I actually feel like cream cheese sometimes, as you could see, I was struggling with it. When it's too cold, it's really, really dense. Um, and I, I, w I want it to be kind of a lighter cheesecake, much like um, a Junior's, if everyone's had like a Junior's cheesecake or something like that, like a New York style cheesecake. And I just puree this. I need to push down my cream cheese because it's a little cold. Just start with that room temperature. That's what I say. The ricotta, though, it could really be cold. I mean, it could be anything. It's better if it's room temperature, but the ricotta has a much higher moisture content. Um, so that's good. All right, so you just puree this until it's good. Feel free to scrape down the bowl if you need to. Mmm, yes. It has no eggs because it's a no-bake, and obviously, I mean, I don't have a problem eating raw eggs. Um, I know a lot of people do. Um, raw eggs, believe it or not, if you treat them correctly, they're fine. Just don't tell anyone I told you that. I'm not trying to get in trouble here. Okay, so then we just lift it out, and you scrape it right into your chilled crust. And the good news about this is, I mean, part of what makes this really really nice as a no-bake is because the, I mean, it's funny, be, sorry, I'm getting confusing. I, what I dislike about cream cheese is that it's really, really firm and dense, but that's actually what makes this a no-bake cheesecake because when you chill or freeze the cream cheese, it becomes sliceable, and that's actually what gives you, that's what actually makes you not have to use the eggs and put it in the oven and all that. So you put it right in there. I'm making a mess, and then I use a little offset spatula Go all the way around, spread it out. I'm telling you, if you make this cheesecake, which the recipe is available in Just Cook It by Justin Chappell, um, you're gonna make this all the time because it's so easy um, and it comes together really nicely and you can put it in the free, because you put it in the freezer. So because it's in the freezer, once it's firm, you can actually put plastic over it and you could leave it in there for days. So you can make this on like a Monday and then have it on Friday night if you have a dinner party. And just like that, this goes into the freezer. We have another one. The freezer chills it in two seconds. Um, and look at this. Let me move this out of your way. Do we have a platter for this? <laughs> Thank you. Oh my gosh, look. Um, and you just put it on your little plate. I'm actually gonna leave it on this, and I'm gonna cut it here because that has a lip on it. That one I did garlic, so I'm gonna use the slicer here. Oh wait, no, I wanna make it look like the book. Okay, find the picture of the book. Okay, come show the camera. <laughs> so everyone could see. There you go, you're not supposed to come up here. <laughs> so that's the no-bake cheesecake that we're making. Okay, come back and get the book. Yeah, you're not supposed to come up here. There they are. I knew they were here somewhere. Um, so this is just macerated strawberries. Everyone knows how to do that, right? You just, they're actually not macerated until they're macerated. Macerated actually means to like put something in liquid and let it sit. That's basically what it means. So what you do, what we all do is we put strawberries with sugar, right? And then the sugar is released. Um, and now they're macerating because they're in a liquid. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Okay. I thought I would teach you something today. And you just put it right on top. And we have a lot of strawberries here. And I like to pile it right on top, but of course you can always slice it and then serve these at the table if you want. And this is really cold, so we're gonna see if I can even cut it, but yes, it's perfect. Oh. And then we get a little plate, slash big plate, because that's a dinner plate. Yes, me too. And there you go, you have a no-big cheesecake. And can you see that? Is it on camera? Yeah. <laughs> and if you want to be fancy, like a chef, you take a little bit of the liquid and you kind of drizzle it around the plate like that. 
And that's it. That's a no big cheesecake. You can see it has a really nice texture. Um, if you want, instead of the strawberries, you could just take some more Oreos and go <laughs> and put them on top. Okay, I think I'm way over on time. Um, but I want to thank everyone for coming today. And especially, I want to thank you for coming to the Food and Wine Classic in Aspen because we literally could not put on this festival if you guys didn't come. Um, I'm doing a book signing at 4.30 today in the Grand Tasting. You can buy my book. All right, thank you, everyone.